Okay, um, yes, yeah, so I can skip the welcome because I think everybody kind of knows this one already, how the, the QML meets up formed. Um, and yeah, so let me introduce Matthias. I'm very much looking forward to his talk, so I'm actually quite glad that, that we still go ahead. Um, and I can probably selfishly ask more of my own questions now. So Matthias is um, a doctoral candidate and he is studying in the mathematics department. And, you know, I think he yeah, very much has a, a view of a mathematician, which is quite nice from the Technical University of Munich. And he's working on all things quantum machine learning like and quantum learning theory, classical learning theory and, and so on. So today he'll be talking to us about generalization guarantees and in particular for um, variational quantum machine learning. So yeah, looking forward to it. And I'm so sorry about the mix up with the links to the participants and to Matthias, but we'll do our best to get this recording out. And for those of you who are watching the recording, please um, feel free to email us with questions and we'll, we'll pass them on to, to Matthias. Okay, cool. Let me stop sharing now and hand okay. over to you. Perfect, then I'll take over. You can now see the slides, right? Yes. <clears throat> All right, perfect. Um, then thanks to everybody who made it. And thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, I'm really glad um, to, to speak in this series with so many illustrious prior speakers. And um, today I'll use this opportunity to tell you about generalization guarantees for variational quantum machine learning, which is uh, one of the central topics of my, of my PhD research. And more precisely, I will tell you about um, results from two papers. One of them is published in, in Quantum and the other one you can find on the archive under this identifier if you want. But before I start with the content, I have to start with a very important part of this work, which are my collaborators. So in the first paper, um, which is by now published in Quantum, I got to work with Elias, Johannes, Jens and Ryan. And um, this was really a lot of fun. And even though they are also based in Germany and I am based in Germany, uh, we did that via Zoom only, thanks to the pandemic. But the advantage of this was that I could also collaborate with people who were way farther away. Um, so here you see Robert, Marco, Kunal, Andrew, Lukas, and Patrick, um, who are in the US. But um, fortunately, we could still make this collaboration work. And like I said, today I'll be presenting results from both of these papers. But so before presenting any results, I want to tell you why I even work on this and what my perspective on these questions is. So um, if you go to a talk about quantum machine learning, uh, you probably want to know what machine learning is if you don't already know. Um, and what you could say is that machine learning is a new paradigm of meta algorithms. So by that, I mean that instead of coding by hand for all eventualities, you try to learn from data and thereby create an algorithm. You might want to do this because in many cases, like an image recognition, there's really a huge a number of possible eventualities and you cannot take care of all of them. So instead you try to extract rules from data. And now if you look at this through the lens of a mathematician and you dream a little bit, then what you want to do is to really understand what the training data and computational requirements for successful machine learning are. So how many data points do you need to see? And how much computation uh, and how much computational power do you need to invest? Now let's take a, a similar high level perspective on quantum computing. So we can also think of quantum computing as a new paradigm of computing. And now we're not like going from algorithms to meta algorithms, but rather we're changing what kind of computers we use. So we use quantum mechanical instead of classical computers. Why? Well, there's many reasons. Um, I think one um, fundamental reason is that quantum mechanics is fundamental to nature, or at least that's what we currently believe. And therefore we should try and find out whether it's fundamental to computation as well. Now let's again be mathematicians and dream. Well, actually it's not so much a mathematician's dream, it's the dream of any quantum scientist or quantum information scientist at least, that you might want to really understand rigorously when quantum computing is guaranteed to outperform classical computing at some task. Now, what happens if you throw the two together? Then you get quantum machine learning. Now, quantum machine learning is, um, at least as I understand it, not a uniquely defined term. By that, I mean there's very many flavors of this topic. So one would be learning-inspired approaches to quantum information. Um, so for example, in, in recent years, uh, there has been a lot of work on classical shadows and 
randomized measurement techniques. Um, and these really give new insight into understanding physical objects. There's also a completely new kind of access to data that you can imagine. Um, and this then also leads to new learning procedures. And in, as a third point, you can think of new machine learning models that you can only build because you use quantum computing. So in that sense, um, quantum machine learning, learning would be something like quantum assisted machine learning. And probably there's way more flavors of this that, that I don't cover here. And for the purposes of this talk, I'll focus on the third. So I'll think about machine learning models based on quantum computing. So um, to round off the, motiv uh, the, the motivation, I want to emphasize that there's always at least, but definitely two important aspects in any machine learning problem, namely optimization and generalization. So let's start with optimization. This is basically the question of how and when you can successfully train your model. And by train a model, I mean make your model fit the training data that you have. So um, here maybe is a good time for me to say I'm working with supervised learning. So I assume that you have some labels that you can try to fit. And so optimization means getting a good fit on the training data. Now, this is a crucial part of machine learning. But it's not sufficient for good learning because the second aspect generalization comes in. So generalization is the question of, in machine learning terms, how and when does the model avoid overfitting? Now, you can also formulate this as how and when does a good performance on the training data actually guarantee a good performance on data that you haven't seen before? And data that you haven't seen before is really the important part, right? Because the training data you already have. So there's no need in, in learning on the training data. And this will be the focus of this talk. So the focus of this talk will be generalization. So it will be the question, how much training data is needed or sufficient for good generalization in variational quantum machine learning? And my goal for the talk is basically to uh, show you how I think about variational quantum machine learning and to show you two results um, that we have that help understand the generalization behavior of these models. So this also means I will not really talk about optimization, um, even though it's a crucial part. So maybe keep that in the back of your mind that this is a task you also have to take into account. It's just that I won't focus on it today. So here's a rough outline for what I want to do today. Um, I want to first give you an introduction to classical learning theory. So this will be something like a crash course. Um, and I'll highlight some interesting concepts, some important definitions. Then we'll actually make things quantum. So I'll tell you about variational quantum machine learning models. And after introducing those models, I will use the learning theoretic techniques from the crash course to um, explain to you the generalization bounds we have there. And then um, if there's still time, I will tell you a little bit about applications and implications of these bounds. And in the end, I'll uh, try my best to summarize and also tell you a bit about possible next directions. And then I'm very much looking forward to your questions. So crash course in classical learning theory. Um, let me start with uh, a comic that I drew once and that I like a lot, so I'll, I'll keep explaining it. Um, so let me tell, tell you about the intuition behind what's called pack learning. So in this scenario, you have a learner, and then somewhere in the world, um, you have a distribution over inputs. So think of X as an input space might be images that you're trying to classify, might also be real numbers or vectors. And then you have some function which takes these inputs and maps it to some label space. So that might, for example, if you do image classification, the labels might be cat, dog, car, whatever. Um, but again, the, the labels might also be real numbers. And maybe you know that this F star lies in some function class F. But what you do not know is what mu is. So you don't know this probability distribution. And you also don't know what f star is. So you don't know the unknown labeling function. And the goal is to learn the labeling function. Now, how does the learner get access to that? The learner gets access to the unknown function through training data. And training data in this framework of supervised learning consists of pairs. So it's of the form xi, f star of xi, where i goes from one to m if the training data has m examples. 
So these are labeled examples. And the crucial statistical assumption in pack learning theory is that the XI are IID. So that means they're identically distributed and they're drawn independently from this measure mu. Now, given this training data, what's the learner supposed to do? Well, the learner should output a hypothesis. So some function, maybe in the same class that you already know the unknown function to be in, which maps the inputs to labels. Of course, it shouldn't be any hypothesis. It should be a good hypothesis in the sense that it approximates the unknown function. And what I want to emphasize is that in pack learning theory, you require, um, or in one branch in pack learning theory, you require um, an approximation to the unknown function f star only with respect to the underlying probability measure. So that means if there are inputs that get very low weight under your data generating probability measure, it's not so important if you misclassify them. On the other hand, you have to do well on, on points that get, um, on, on inputs that have high weight or high probability of appearing. So that's kind of the intuition that I have when thinking about pack learning. Now, um, let me tell you about the, in my opinion, the simplest idea for learning and um, why this might work in some cases. So this is the so-called empirical risk minimization principle. And informally, this says the following. Somewhere in the back of your head, you have an assumption. And the assumption would be that this calligraphic f, so that's the class of functions that you kind of know the unknown function to be in or that you use, um, that you know your machine learning model will output functions in. And the assumption is somehow that this concept class has low complexity. Now, this isn't well defined, but what I mean is that um, it has low complexity relative to the training data. So by complexity, you could maybe think about parameter counting or something, even though that's not exactly it. And now if you have a function class with low complexity, then what you try is to find some function in the class that fits the training data well. And you hope that this doesn't only fit the training data well, but that it also fits other points that you haven't seen before. Now, the kind of obvious question is, why should something like this work? So why does fitting the training data well um, extend to points that you haven't seen before, assuming that a class has low complexity? And this is basically now leading us to the question of generalization. So here, what we want to do is we want to guarantee that a good training performance implies a good prediction performance on previously unseen data points. And what I want to convince you of here is that um, classical learning theory with complexity measures gives us a way of uh, understanding this. So let me get to the technical slide of this talk. Um, it's the definition of a so-called probably approximately correct generalization bound. And while the slide is a bit technical, I think the definition itself is actually uh, pretty beautiful. And I hope that you enjoy it a little bit while I walk you through it. So um, to start us, off, we need a function class f. So think of this as the class of functions your model can implement. So that might be everything your neural network can output. It might be everything your support vector machine can do. Um, or it might be everything your quantum machine learning model can produce. And then you have some loss function, uh, which compares two labels and then outputs a value that's 0 if the labels are very close to one another or very similar. And it outputs a larger value. I put some constant C here as maximum value um, if they're far from each other. So the loss function kind of evaluates how good the performance of the prediction is. And now with those ingredients, we can define a PAC generalization bound. So PAC is just the abbreviation for probably approximately correct. Um, and I'll use it quite a lot in this talk. Uh, for the experts, um, this is only in the realizable case because it's easier to write down but um, you could extend it if you want. So what we want is a guarantee that works for any probability measure P over inputs and for any function in the class F. And we make this assumption or we make this requirement because like I said before in my comic, we don't know the data generating probability measure and we don't know the unknown function. So maybe we want something that works no matter what these unknown objects are. And now we want something to hold with high success probability over the choice of training data. 
So remember, the training data consisted of these examples xi, f star of xi, where the xi were drawn iid from the data generating distribution p. And here, this with high success probability is why there's a probably in, in the probably approximately correct. And this is because you be, could be unlucky. So it could be that the training data you see is just not very useful in learning the function. Um, and we want to make sure with our generalization bound that an event like this has low probability. Now, the guarantee that we want is something that should hold for all, function uh, for all functions in our class, because we don't yet know what we're going to end up with. And the guarantee is something of the following form. So we want to upper bound an expectation value. So this is an integral against the probability measure, i.e. an expectation value, over the loss comparing the true label with the label produced by the hypothesis H. So this is basically the expected performance of the hypothesis H in predicting F star. And this is what we want to, um, to minimize, because remember, a small loss was good and a big loss was bad. The issue with this expression is that we cannot evaluate it as a learner, because we don't know the probability measure P and we don't know the function F star. So let's try to control this quantity we care about but cannot evaluate by something we can actually evaluate. And an, a somewhat natural idea is to, instead of doing a true average, um, to do an empirical average. So to take the loss comparing the performance of the true function and the hypothesis on the training data points and then averaging over the whole training data set. Now, while the left-hand side is called true or expected risk, this is often called the training risk or sometimes training error. And this we can evaluate if we know the training data and if we know H, but H is what our model produces, so that's easy. Now, of course, or maybe not of course, but it makes sense that this bound isn't just true without any other terms. We, we will have to pay a little bit here. Um, so I denote this here just by a function G, which will depend on the function class F and on the training data size M. So this is the mistake we're making in going from this true risk we cannot evaluate to the training error we can evaluate. And the goal is basically to understand what these functions G are um, and how, for example, they depend on F and M. A little bit of terminology. Um, if you rearrange the thing by putting the training error to the left-hand side, then what you end up with on the left-hand side is the difference between the true expected risk and the training risk. And that's called the generalization error of, of this hypothesis H. So just to recap, um, if, if this was a little bit too technical, a generalization bound is about understanding how much you have to, uh, or is about understanding how you can guarantee that the expected risk is small if the only thing you can control is the training risk. These generalization bounds, of course, only work if you have reasonable functions G. So that's really what we want to understand here. How, does the, how do, the, do these functions G depend on F? And OK, also, how do they depend on the training data size M? An answer from classical learning theory that you can find when digging in the literature are complexity measures. So complexity measures have a, have a long history in classical learning theory. Um, and that's why there's loads of them. So for example, there is the VC dimension, which you might have heard of because it's probably the first and maybe the most important. There are generalizations of it called pseudo dimension and fat right dimension. There's things like Rademacher complexities and there are so-called covering numbers and metric entries. And then there's uh, many more, many I probably also don't know, um, but these are some of the well-known ones. And always the idea is to characterize how complex your function class is. Uh, so, sorry, Matthias, Amir, you wanted to say something. Yes, yeah. Well, do you mind um, a quick question Please. from someone in the audience? So they ask, um, how is G, this function G that you mentioned, different from statistical fluctuations? Yes, very, very good question. A uh, very good question. So um, it's exactly right that what G does is it captures statistical fluctuations. Um, so maybe let me go back. So 
Um, if you studied a little bit of probability theory, something like this might seem very familiar to you because on the left hand side, you have an expectation and on the right hand side, you have an empirical average. So what you usually expect is that the empirical average converges to the expectation as uh, while you increase the number of, of um, realizations that you're averaging over. In other words, you expect the law of large numbers to hold. Um, the cool thing in these puck generalization bounds is that you don't just get a good old law of large numbers, but you get a uniform law of large numbers. So it's uniform over all functions in a certain class. And basically, puck generalization bounds are about understanding how the complexity of a class influences um, the, how, how bad these statistical fluctuations can be in the worst case, if you make them uniform over the class. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks for the question. That was a really good one. So there's loads of these complexity measures. Um, I want to tell you about one, uh, namely the so-called empirical covering numbers, and hopefully give you a little bit of an intuition for why they should be called a complexity measure. So um, sorry, here's another drawing of mine. Um, so imagine that this ball is our class of functions. So this is the class of functions our model can implement. And now what we try to do when thinking about covering numbers is something like the following. We take a, a point in the ball, which means we take a function in our class, and then we put a small ball around it. So here with some radius epsilon. And now you don't just do this once, but you do this with many points in the function class. And you try to do this um, often enough until you've covered the whole class. So until your, your balls, your small epsilon balls cover the, the big ball that is the whole function class. And um, now covering numbers are basically the minimum number of epsilon balls that you need to cover the whole function class. So in some sense, this, or to me, this um, can be called a complexity measure of the function class because it means that you can essentially view the function class through the lens of the centers of these balls, right? So everything inside the epsilon ball around that point is very similar to that point, uh, at least morally. And therefore, the smaller the covering numbers are, the simpler the function class is. Um, now, one more detail. Why do I call them empirical covering numbers? That's because if you want to take a ball around the point, you need a notion of distance. And what you do in learning theory is to take a notion of distance that depends on the training data that you've seen. And training data dependent quantities are usually called empirical. So this is what I mean by empirical covering numbers. So this is, um, like I said, a short crash course in classical learning theory, which is a, a beautiful subject. Um, and I can definitely recommend spending some time on it. I enjoyed it quite a lot. But this was purely classical so far. Um, so let's go and make things a little bit quantum by talking about variational quantum machine learning models. I'll give you some high level ideas first. Probably you're already familiar with them um, if you attended the prior QML meetup, but still, um, let's go through them. So what's a variational quantum machine learning model? Such models are described by quantum circuits with trainable parameters. And these are sometimes called parametrized quantum circuits. So that means you have quantum circuits, and in some of the gates, you have classical parameters that you can tune, something like rotation angles. And now, in variational quantum machine learning, you use quantum computers on the one hand, and you use them to evaluate predictions, to evaluate loss functions, and to evaluate their gradients. And once you have these values and their gradients, you, you, you give them to a classical computer. And the classical computer is going to optimize the trainable parameters that you have in your quantum gates. This, this like distribution of tasks um, is pretty crucial because if you want to do a difficult optimization problem on a quantum computer, you will probably have to wait a while. Um, at, at least there are not that many near-term algorithms for optimizing these in these very difficult optimization regimes that I know of, I should probably say. And therefore, the, the idea here is to use quantum computers for something that you can maybe already use them in the near term for, and to outsource the optimization to a classic computer. And the moral of the story is that classically optimizing quantum circuits can be considered a hybrid quantum classical approach 
to variational quantum machine learning. So let's um, do this in pictures. This is one kind of variational quantum machine learning model, or if you want a parameterized quantum circuit. Let me explain my color coding. So this is a quantum circuit and everything that's red, so T1 up to T4, you should think of as trainable gates. So that means that there are some classical parameters in these gates that you can tune. On the other hand, everything that's blue, so F1 to F3, you should consider fixed. So these are fixed quantum gates that you cannot train. Um, you can imagine, for example, that these are maybe Hadama gates or C0 gates, which you probably often want to have in your quantum circuits. Um, and maybe you just don't want to change them throughout the training. Something I want to emphasize is that um, what you can already see in this picture, for the fixed gates, they could act on all qubits at the same time, at least in principle. The trainable gates, I want to restrict to act on few qubits at the same time. So in particular, let's you, you can always think of them as being too local. On the technical side, it doesn't matter. They can be K local um, as long as the K doesn't grow with the number of qubits. And now what you can do with such a variational quantum machine learning model is feed in a quantum state, um, let it run through the circuit, and in the end, perform a measurement. And then based on the measurement outcome, you can update parameters um, and therefore try and minimize some loss. Now, a possible issue with this machine learning model is that I, what I just said is you can input a quantum state. But maybe you don't want to learn on data that is like inherently quantum states. Now, if you want to learn on classical data, you first have to get a quantum state out of it. And one way of doing this is by um, taking a similar machine learning model. So you see this, this circuit is the same I showed you before. And what you do now is you have a, an initial layer here in green that encodes classical data into a quantum state. So what this E should do is it's some gate that takes the zero status input. And then depending on what classical data you're trying to evaluate your functions on, the gate E changes and prepares a different quantum state. You can also think of E as being a parameterized gate, but now the parameterized, uh, sorry, the parameters are your inputs. And this you can now use to do machine learning on uh, quantum machine learning on classical data, because through this green gate E, you can input classical data to the quantum circuit. And now, if you look at this picture, there's a certain asymmetry, right? Because the red gates are distributed, the blue gates are distributed, but the green one isn't. And um, this was the case for some years in QML research. And then uh, some people came along and said, well, let's um, also distribute the green gates. So this is uh, definitely possible. And it's actually important for, for one of uh, the two papers that I'm going to speak about. So the difference is that here, we first get as input classical data and then prepare a quantum state and then feed that quantum state to the rest of the circuit. What we do here is that we don't prepare a state in the beginning. It's more that this idea of having some additional gates that are parameterized by the classical inputs, we can just distribute those gates throughout the circuit. And now the state you get at the output will depend on the chosen parameters in the red gates. It will also depend on the inputs because they parameterize the green gates and it'll obviously depend on fixed gates. And now again, you can in the end perform a measurement to evaluate loss functions and so on, and then you can optimize. So this is how you can make quantum machine learning models also work on classical data if you want to. All right, now um, let me do this because I, I need to, because I'm a mathematician. Um, if you want to not think about this in pictures, but as a mathematical object, you should think of this as a parameterized quantum operation. So either it's a parameterized unitary, if you have a unitary quantum circuit, but you could also have some noise in there actually. And then it's a parameterized quantum channel or maybe a more general uh, parameterized quantum operation. The, if you don't know these terms, that's not so important. You probably know that um, quantum circuits are often thought of as unitaries. Then you can think for the rest of the talk of such a quantum machine learning model as a parameterized unitary. And like I said, there are two kinds of parameters. The one would be really the trainable parameters, theta, and the other would be the classical inputs, x. 
are sometimes um, maybe abuse notation a little bit because if you already have a quantum input, you don't need green encoding gates. Um, so then actually there is no X, um, but uh, the idea remains the same. So these are the models um, that we're going to look at. Now, let me tell you how you can evaluate the performance of such a model. Um, actually, there's two ways depending on what you want. So the first would be the following. You now have your nice quantum circuit. How can you get out of this thing a function? And you can do this as follows. So if you fix a parameter setting theta, so some values for these, let's say, rotation angles in your circuit, what you can do is consider the function f theta that takes an input to a real number that's obtained by doing what the circuit does, so feeding in the zero state to this parameterized circuit. Then you get an output state and then measure some observable m on the output state. And okay, the observable m will have to depend on your setup. You could, for example, measure in the computational basis and take a, a certain, um, certain operator there. Now, if you do this for a single parameter, you can do it for everyone. And that means you really get a function class associated to your model. So just by changing the values of the parameters. And these are then just real value functions going from some input space X to um, the output space R. And like I said, if your input space is already quantum states, then you don't need the encoding. So now we have a function class and now we're in the setting that I showed you before, right? We have a function class so we can take any loss function which compares two real numbers and then evaluate the performance of a hypothesis in that class. So this is somehow how you can embed the, the quantum machine learning setting into this classical machine learning framework. There's actually a, a second version that's similar, but not quite the same. Um, you can, and I, I think you can argue that both have their merit. So here, instead of, um, hey, let me compare, compare it here. So, here, what we do is for a fixed parameter setting, um, we always measure the same observable to get out some function value. And then we apply a loss function. You could also try and evaluate a loss function directly by measuring. So in that sense, your observable O loss XY would, would be the loss function, just now it's an observable. And measuring it on the output of your quantum machine learning model will give you the value of the loss function. And then, if you've done this, or if you've done the previous one where you first got a function and evaluated the loss function on it, you can get the empirical risk as before just by averaging over the training data. And you can get the true or the expected risk just by taking an expectation value over the data generating distribution. So in both cases, um, what you basically do is you measure something on the output of the circuit, and then you maybe post process it to get a loss function value. And this is now the scenario for which we prove generalization bounds uh, for these models. Now, the intuition that I tried to give you before with the covering numbers is that the complexity of a class matters. So let's think about these quantum machine learning models and where the complexity there could come from or why it could be limited. One aspect that I will not talk about today is that the choice of the measurement that you perform at the end of the circuit can play a role. Um, like I said, I won't talk about it today, but if you want to learn more about it, there's a nice paper um, by Kaspek Jurek and, and others from Leiden who considered this. The second thing you can think about is the trainable part. So in my color coding before, those were the red gates, which have trainable parameters that you can tune. And this obviously plays a role, right? Because it's a machine learning model. So how, how much there you can actually train plays a role for how complex it is in the end. There have been some prior works on this already. Um, and it is also the focus of the second of the two papers I mentioned in the beginning. And um, I will tell you more about the details later, but I would argue that the bounds we get are more general than what prior work proved and also a little bit stronger. And then you can take a complementary perspective by looking at the green gates that we had before. So the data encoding gates. And this is the focus of this first paper um, that I wrote with some people in Berlin. And um, again, I'll tell you about some details in a, few, in a few slides. So let me first 
tell you about the result that I have with uh, Robert Huang and others. So this is about how the trainable gates in your circuit influence the generalization behavior. So we start from a quantum machine learning model with T trainable local gates. So by local, I just uh, mean that it acts on, let's say, two qubits at most at the same time. Now, what we show is that such a machine learning model, if you look at the corresponding function class, you can bound its covering numbers. And more precisely, you can bound these empirical covering numbers that we had before. And you can show that their logarithm scales basically like T log T over epsilon, um, if you look at the epsilon covering number. Now, the crucial thing I want to emphasize here is the scaling in T. So if you have T trainable gates, then this scales only slightly superlinearly with T. And then we use this to show that you can up about the generalization error. So how much the true risk deviates from the training risk. And you can up about it by roughly the square root of T log T over N um, if you train on data of size N and this bound holds with high probability. This looks a bit technical, so let's think about why this might be interesting. Uh, one easy interesting case is the following. If you think about machine learning models with polynomial size, so polynomially many gates, which kind of makes sense because they're efficiently implementable, then this generalization error bound <coughs> tells you that you can get good generalization as soon as n is roughly like t log t. And if t is polynomial in the number of qubits, then it suffices to have n polynomial in the number of qubits. So you can learn a polynomial size quantum machine learning model, apologies, from polynomial size training data. Me being a mathematician, I wanna show you a proof, but I also know that I probably shouldn't go into too many details. So you get an extra sketchy proof sketch from me. Um, the first step is to get a covering number, uh, to get covering number bounds for a single local trainable quantum gate. And this turns out is super easy. And then what we show is that if you have covering number bounds for each single gate in a circuit, you can lift this to covering number bounds for the whole parameterized quantum circuit. And once we have the covering number bounds, we use some big hammers from classical learning theory and classical random process theory. Um, and those um, are known in classical learning theory to show that empirical covering number bounds imply generalization error bounds. So the first two steps here are used to, to establish this first inequality. And the third step then uh, shows you how to get from this first to the second. So the takeaway message is that you can bound the generalization error of a quantum machine learning model in terms of the number of trainable gates. What, what we did in the, um, in the paper now published in Quantum, where I worked on with my Berlin colleagues, is to show that you can do something similar in spirit from the data encoding in these quantum machine learning models. So here, um, I have to start a little bit differently because it actually doesn't work for every data encoding strategy. Um, but if you use, let's say, a reasonable one, or if you use one of the commonly used ones, um, then something like the following is true. If you have a quantum machine learning model with E data encoding gates, so E is the natural number, then we can again bound the covering numbers. And we're going to see that the log of the covering numbers scales roughly polynomially in E. And the exact polynomial depends on what data encoding strategy you use. And then from the covering number bound, we again get a generalization error bound. And this time it's um, that the generalization error scales at worst like square root of something polynomial in E divided by N, where N is the training data size. Okay, th this looks pretty similar to what we had before, only that now we have a polynomial where before we just had a linear function. Uh, why should you care? I think one interesting implication is the following. Before we looked at efficiently implementable quantum machine learning models with like polynomially many trainable gates. Now, what if the trainable part is super complicated? So maybe exponentially deep, then the previous bound isn't gonna give you anything. But this bound now tells you if the data encoding is simple enough, you can still train from few training data points, even though the trainable part is super complicated. And in fact, the other way around works too. You can have a super complicated encoding so that this bound doesn't work pretty well, 
But then the trainable part, if it's simple enough, still gives you a useful generalization though. Okay, and again, the mathematician in me wants to give you a proof sketch. Um, so the first step here is very different from, from the other proof. So what we observe here is that uh, these quantum machine learning models and the functions they implement are actually pretty tightly related to trigonometric polynomials, or to be more precise, to a generalized version of them. And in particular, if you think about the trig trigonometric polynomial, so sine and cosine with some frequencies, frequency factors in front of the x, then it turns out that the accessible frequencies that you can get there are determined by the data encoding in the quantum machine learning model. So that means that understanding the effect of the data encoding on the complexity of a quantum machine learning model boils down to understanding the effect of the frequency spectrum on the complexity of a trigonometric polynomial. And here we observe that the size of this frequency spectrum can be understood as an effective dimension, and that this gives you covering number bounds. Okay, and then we've got covering number bounds, so we can um, use our same hammers from classical learning theory from before to get generalization bounds. All right, now this was the theory part, and these are, I would argue, the two of the main results of these two papers. Um, if I have a little bit more time, I would go into applications and implications. Um, or is that a good point to answer some questions, Amira? Um, maybe I can just ask you the two questions that are in the chat. So mm -hmm. um, the first one was just about the bounds. So there was uh, a question from Renato again, asking if there are bounds showing that T scales of order polynomial in, polynomial in N. Um, yes, so I think maybe... Okay. So meant, yeah. Um, yeah. You can, I mean, okay, if I understand the question correctly, um, so in, in general, you cannot show that T scales polynomially in the number of qubits in N. Um, that would be like a feature of your model. But if you think of, uh, let's say, a realistic quantum machine learning model, then it should be something like a realistic quantum circuit. And usually we think of realistic quantum circuits as being efficiently implementable, so having polynomially many gates. And, and then you could think of this as like a heuristic reason for T scaling polynomially with the number of qubits. Okay, perfect. And the other one I think is a quick one. It was just about the two versions that you had of the models. And mm -hmm. the question was just about the second one. Like, don't we always work with version two, exactly this one here um, mm -hmm. in practice? Um, yeah, um, it depends a little bit, I would argue. Um, because so this version, as I write it here, doesn't have a post processing of measurement outcomes built in, um, but you can make that work. That's not much of an issue. Um, I guess it depends a little bit on whether you, how do I say this? It depends a bit on whether you want the expectation value to be your function value. That would be what we're doing here. Um, or whether you want to, average over, or whether you want to average over measurement outcomes. Um, so I agree that the two are very similar. And in fact, you can combine the two into like a general version. Um, I believe that there's still a slight difference, but I, I guess you could make an argument that the second one is the more physical one because you perform measurements. Perfect, thank you. All right, then thanks again for the questions. And let me just, um, show you some possible applications and implications, and then we can um, go on to some more questions if you want. So the first one I want to talk about is structure risk minimization. Um, so this has a very simple underlying idea. So look at this, this plot. On the x-axis, you should think of complexity. So uh, something like the complexity of your function class might be, for example, the covering numbers. And think of them as a tunable parameter, because maybe you increase the number of gates in your circuit or something like this. And on the y-axis, you see different kinds of error. And the different kinds are in blue, the training error. And usually what you expect is that as you increase complexity, the training error can go down because you have more expressive and you can fit the training data better. But at the same time, the generalization error would grow. Uh, so this is the, the orange curve. That's because usually the generalization error grows as the complexity grows. 
But what you care about is neither blue nor orange. What you care about is actually the sum of the two curves. So this is the red here. And you want this to be small. So that means you want to find this sweet spot here um, where, where the sum is smallest. And that's the idea behind structural risk minimization. It's to, to not just look at the training error, but to maybe look at the training error while keeping generalization in mind already. And then there's different ways of implementing that. Now, what you can do with the bounds I showed you is to see two possible complexity measures from these bounds arising, namely the number of trainable gates and the number of encoding gates. And now if you have this structural risk minimization picture in mind, what you can do is you can try and simultaneously vary in your models how many trainable gates you have and how many encoding gates you have. And this could help you find a sweet spot between good training performance and good generalization. So in some sense, these generalization bounds with the structural risk minimization idea could help you design quantum machine learning models. So design how many gates you want in there. So this is still like a conceptual thing. Um, whoops, let's uh, look at a look at a maybe more applied application. Um, so this is the task of quantum phase recognition or quantum phase classification. Usually this task looks something like the following. Um, you have a ground state of some Hamiltonian. In our case, it was what's called the generalized cluster Hamiltonian, which is a Hamiltonian on a spin chain with two, uh, two parameters, J1 and J2. And what you want to figure out is what phase of the ground state phase diagram does the, does the ground state belong to? In the case of this Hamiltonian, there's four different phases. So you want to assign a label from one to four to this ground state. Now, what we looked at is a machine learning version of the problem. So that means that your input is now training data consisting of different ground states and the corresponding phase labels. And what you're going to output is a quantum machine learning model that given a new quantum status input correctly predicts the phase label. So <clears throat> this is an example where the input is kind of naturally quantum uh, because it's a quantum physics problem. And um, so my colleagues at Los Alamos uh, implemented this using what's called a quantum convolutional neural network, um, which I should point out wasn't our idea, but was uh, brought forward by um, the group of Michael Lukin. And um, you can use this, this quantum convolutional neural network for quantum phase recognition. So what you see on the left is um, the phase diagram of this Hamiltonian. So the uh, black lines delimit the different regions. Um, what you see is that there's five regions. I claimed that there's four phases. That's because the region on top and the region on the bottom turn out to belong to the same phase. And in this picture, the blue crosses um, denote training data points. The blue dots denote points that the machine learning model classified correctly. And the red dots um, denote points where the machine learning model classified incorrectly. So what you can see from the picture is that the classification doesn't seem so bad, right? This um, is performing reasonably well. And uh, I should say that the picture is for a 32 qubit system. So it's actually pretty big. And now how, how does this connect to our theory? Um, for this, I just want to gloss over many details in the right-hand plot and just point out one thing. So quantum convolutional neural networks are nice because they have only logarithmically in the number of qubits many independently trainable gates. So if you remember that our bounds dependent on the number of trainable gates, that's pretty good, right? Because the number of trainable gates is something like logarithm of the number of qubits. So that means as you increase the number of training data points, you should very quickly see that training accuracy becomes a very good predictor for testing accuracy. And this is roughly what you can see in this plot. So um, here you see that the capital N, the training data size is increased for these different colors. And this was for 16 qubits. And what you see is that as we increase the training data size, this becomes closer and closer to a line with slope one. So that means that the training accuracy and the testing accuracy become basically the same. And this shows um, that you can, good gen can get good generalization already from few training data points, especially compared to um, what, what would, for example, the exponential of the number of qubits be. We also looked at a second problem. Um, I guess in the interest of time, I'll keep this a bit short. So this is the problem of unitary compiling. Here, you will get some big n-qubit unitaries. 
So maybe a quantum algorithm you want to run. And, but what you want is like an implementation of that thing. So you want a way of writing that unitary as a quantum circuit uh, with only like two load gates. And we again looked at a quantum machine learning version of the question um, where you get training data, training data consisting of input states and corresponding output states under the unknown unitary. And what you try and do is produce a circuit representation. So in our, in our language, produce a two local quantum machine learning model that correctly predicts outputs of new inputs. And here, um, maybe let me only talk about the left plot. Um, so here, my colleagues at Los Alamos implemented an algorithm um, based on uh, a variation, uh, a variable ansatz, which they call VANT. And um, on the left, what you see is on the x-axis, the number of qubits, and on the y-axis, the minimum training data size required for a certain uh, threshold of good generalization. And essentially what you see is that the growth of this minimum training data size with number of qubits is very mild. So for these two lines, it's linear. And if you train on hard random states, it was essentially constant for the number of qubits we looked at. So also this shows that the dependence of training data on the number of qubits is very mild. And this is because here, these concrete numerics are for compiling the quantum Fourier transform, which has a number of gates growing quadratically with the number of qubits. So already our bounds tell you that the training data is going to scale at worst, like something like quadratic with the number of qubits. The numerics shows that it's actually better for these cases. So let me come to a, to a conclusion and then hopefully we have time for some more questions. So what I told you about today is that classically optimizing quantum circuits is a hybrid quantum classical approach to quantum machine learning. This was why we looked at these models. And our results are extremely general and rigorously proven generalization guarantees for such models. So in particular, one takeaway message was that quantum machine learning models generalize well from polynomial size training data if one of the trainable part or the encoding part have polynomial depth or simple enough, you could say. And the simpler they become, the better the generalization. However, you, you don't just want to make your model as simple as you can be. At the same time, you have to make sure um, that you can also train well. And with our structural risk minimization idea, we give some rough guidelines for how you could design these variational quantum machine learning models, um, taking the perspective of training data requirements into account. And now just at the end, I showed you two um, numerics for quantum phase recognition and for unitary compiling um, that not only support our theoretical guarantees, but even outperform them in, in some cases. So this leads me to um, my last slide, which are some open questions. So the first I just alluded to, um, it's when do quantum machine learning models outperform our bounds? So our bounds are in, in many senses worst case, um, and I think there's room for improvement for interesting applications. Um, a second one is that I'm pretty interested in having a more holistic perspective on all of this. So I kind of separated the trainable part and the encoding, but you could also look at all of it together. Um, and there's some interesting works on this already. Um, one of them from one of your panelists um, and the other one by uh, Leonardo Banchi and co-authors. And then I believe that um, there's still many other applications of quantum machine learning to be explored. And with these generalization bounds, we can now explore them more rigorously. So we actually have some guarantees on how we can make them work and how much training data is needed. But there's still uh, much work left to do um, because even though we now understand a little bit about the training data requirements, we still don't understand them fully. So that was all from my side. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and now I'm looking forward to any questions you might have. Perfect. Thank you so much, Matthias. It was always um, very nice to hear you speak. So yeah, if anybody else has any other any questions, please post them in the, the Q&A. And um, in the meantime, maybe I can just ask you a quick one. So, sure. um, you know, I always try to think about what um, quantum machine learning will look like if we're ever able to get into this regime where, you know, we, we have far more parameters than um, mm. data, right? So like how in, in deep learning, this is that over parameterization regime. And um, what I've seen in some of like our numerics of, of um, our like effective dimension bound is that the bound itself 
performs very differently in, in the regime where it's under parameterized and over parameterized and in particular it becomes vacuous right so I was just wondering mm -hmm. if you can say something about um, the bounds that you have in these in these two regimes and is it obvious how they would behave yeah I can try um so the first thing I can say is that this bound that depends on the number of trainable gates this is going to become vacuous in the over parameterized regime because over-parameterization basically means having a huge number of, of trainable gates. Um, and that means that the, the, this bound blows up and it essentially becomes useless. So that's right, this, these bounds are useless, uh, useful only if you don't over-parameterize. However, this bound in principle could also work in the over-parameterization regime because it doesn't look at all at the number of trainable gates. It only looks at your encoding. So if your encoding remains simple while you increase the number of training parameters, you can still enjoy good generalization. Um, however, then I'm also not sure what over parameterization looks like in, in the setting, because maybe if your encoding is simple enough, um, you already reach like full expressivity at some level of parameters. And then I'm not sure if over parameterization actually helps. Um, but at least from the perspective of generalization, there's like a, um, a bound that you will never fail. Um, so at least you have some guarantee. Okay, cool, perfect. Um, all right, then hey, a also, question. Uh, oh, sorry, go for it. Sorry, I had a quick question as well. I actually had a couple of questions we'll also get to the Q&A um, part. Right. Um, so uh, maybe just to understand, you made a comment about the structural risk minimization that, uh, could you elaborate on, on that a little bit? Because um, so, as far as I remember from classical machine learning classes, we usually do that where, you know, your hypothesis class is non-uniformly learnable and you can mm -hmm. write it as a union over some pack learnable classes. Yep. So are you saying because we can write our QML model as this generalized trigonometric functions, it sort of reduces to, you know, it's made up of all these separately or, you know, for yeah. each degree of polynomial, it's pack learnable or agnostic pack learnable. Yeah, exactly. So, so this would be one way of looking at it. You can also really think of a family of, um, of non-uniformly learnable quantum machine learning models where you kind of have two, par two parameters you tune. Like one would be how many trainable gates you have and one would be how many encoding gates you have. And for each of those models, you can then look at our generalization bounds and, and they'll, they'll tell you how much data you need for generalization. And then you could use the structure risk minimization idea to kind of find a sweet spot between how many gates you actually want to train well, but where you should maybe stop to not um, hurt the generalization performance too much. So mm -hmm. it's right, you can think about this in, in non-uniform learnability uh, language if you want. You could also think about it in terms of something like regularized um, regularized risk minimization, um, yeah. where you regularize it would be like to have, have to do with number of trainable gates or something like this. Because when you bring in the the SRM, then you have to have like some kind of weightage assigned to different parts of your mm -hmm. model. And you are allow, allowing that different hypotheses or models could be learned with different sample sizes. But I don't know if you're doing that for now. Is that like a proposal yeah. or? I, I guess it depends a bit on your setup. Um, I, I would say that yes, because um, like the, the number of samples that you need for generalization depends on the number of gates. Mm -hmm. So you, you could think of, I don't know. So I, I was thinking that maybe in the beginning, I don't know, do I want to use 10 gates? Do I want to use a hundred? Do I want to use a thousand? Um, and then I could use the structural risk minimization to figure it out. Um, mm -hmm. That was the, the rough idea. Okay, thank you. I'll postpone my other question to after yeah. it because <laughs> All right. yeah, let's hear from the audience first. Go ahead, Amira. Okay, cool. So one from uh, Karim. Can we overcome the bounds by designing suitable quantum kernels? I think this is quite a general question mm -hmm. about kernels. Yeah. So um, I, I think this is an interesting question. So for, for these quantum machine learning models um, that I showed, let me go back. So this thing here, um, at least as far as I know, is usually not considered in terms of some kernel framework, but this here is um, because here the basically this first part, so the tagging of the quantum state and then encoding it, encoding classical data somehow, producing an output quantum state, basically gives you a, a quantum kernel. And it turns out that even if you distribute the gates throughout the circuit, you can still do something like a kernel perspective on this. Um, and 
so there is some some cool work also from the group in Leiden who who looked at this a little bit more, and so if if you think in quantum kernel terminology, then I wouldn't recommend um, I wouldn't recommend using this bound because quantum kernels can be seen to correspond to quantum machine learning models that are like infinitely deep, so like an infinite depth limit. And if they're infinitely deep, then t goes to infinity, so the bound becomes pretty bad. Um, if you want to know more about this, um, there's a paper by uh, Robert Huang that he actually talked about in the series. So it was power of, of quantum data, I think. There they talk a bit about this. Uh, also, Maria Schult has a nice presentation of this in, in quantum machine learning models or, or kernel methods. But the point I'm making is that it somehow corresponds to infinite depth, and then you don't want to use this bound. Um, in contrast, this bound might still be useful because this actually depends on the encoding. And like I said before, the encoding in this model somehow corresponds to the quantum kernel you're trying to use. Um, so yeah, I, I think you could use something there, um, but I don't know the details I have to say. <laughs> okay, perfect. That's good. Um, then a question from Matt. Um, how do we know the covering number uh, the covering numbers cover the class of functions f, the larger mm -hmm. circle presented earlier, or do mm -hmm. we usually know that class of f beforehand? Yeah, um, good question. So um, in, in my setup here, the class f is basically the class of functions your model can implement. And usually if you know your model, then at least in principle, you know the class of functions it can implement. Um, so for example, uh, I mentioned here that you can understand the functions in terms of these trigonometric polynomials. So you can really write down the functions, function class you can implement. Um, some potential confusion might have been that I was focusing on realizable learning, where I assumed that the unknown function was actually in the same class. Um, that's not crucial for any of these bounds. So I, I don't assume that the unknown function can be perfectly implemented by my quantum circuit. Even if that's not the case, um, you can still learn something. So in that sense, yeah, you know the function class because you uh, because you know what model you're using. I actually had a related questions to mm -hmm. uh, to the covering numbers. So I can understand. Uh, so when we do that for the sets, like in set theory. I understand how we define the distances, but mm -hmm. you said like here, the distances can depend on how the data is. So yeah. is this something like how the data looks for a certain data point? Like how we look at, I don't know, love shitness or how, how is the data, uh, distance metric being translated from data to distance between functions? Yeah, I, I love questions that I have prepared slides for. Um, <laughs> so I'll take this one. Uh, <laughs> you can <know> so <laughs> Um, for, for these covering numbers, um, if you want to de de define them, taking the data into account, you basically do this as follows. So the overall space that you have is the space of all functions, so from x to y. And in that space, there's the set f of the functions that you can implement, and this is what you want to cover. And now the question is, how do you measure distances between functions? And whoops, that was one to y. And, and you do this in this way. So the xi are the inputs that you see in your training data. And what you're going to do is you define something like a p-norm distance um, for these functions. Um, and, and you do this by evaluating only on the training data points. Mm -hmm. So you basically compress down your function to what it does on the training data points. And then you get like a finite length vector and you compare the vectors. So this is not a true norm because two functions could be the same, even though they're different functions, but then, well, they're the same function from the perspective of the training data. So that's fine. Mm, so this could look very different depending on our label domain. Uh, yeah, that's true. So what I'm doing here is kind of uh, assuming that the label domain is just the real numbers. Okay. Otherwise you probably want some notion of norm on your label domain. Okay. Um, yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question. Okay, cool. And yeah, I know we're running out of time, Matthias, so I'm sorry for keeping you so much right. over, but maybe just one last question that's also a little bit general. So um, Renato asks, how does one decide how to spread the data encoding throughout the circuit? 
Um, so do you I mean the specific like where to put the where to put the gates? Probably, yeah. And yeah, I think so in this picture. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. And this is maybe a question that I'm not enough of a practitioner of um, to, to properly answer. So what I can say is that from the theory perspective, um, where you put the gates doesn't matter so much for generalization. So some, some things to take into account when, when putting the gate somewhere is, for example, where do you still have free space? Um, so if you have some restrictions for what gates you can implement or what qubits you can connect, then you really want to use the space you have. So for example, in this first layer, if you don't put an encoding gate here, then it's just wasted. <laughs> um, and then maybe you want to make use of it. Um, so this would be one, um, one restriction that you might want to take into account. Then more generally in, in near-term devices, um, there would be some connectivity issues. So this would also tell you something about where you want to put gates and where not. Um, and in general, I think this might also have an effect on how easy it is to train, but I'm not sure about this. I, I don't know enough about this. So it, I, the only thing I can say is that from the perspective of the bound um, that we have so far, it doesn't matter. But that already shows you that there's room for improvement in our bounds, right? Because I guess it should matter. <laughs> so um, this is something that maybe I leave to the person who asked the question to figure out. I would be very happy to learn about this. Okay, awesome. And then one last, last question, and <laughs> unless Arisa has a, also another, but um, Yusuf asks, so I think it's also a general question, which um, yeah, it's just about data augmentation and um, learning distributions through encoding of training data mm -hmm. um, to generate new data using like generative um, generative methods. So the person is just wondering, Yusuf is just wondering, can, can we get something from these quantum machine learning um, mm -hmm. models that, that's special yeah, okay. in this kind of spirit? Mm -hmm. So, um... Okay, maybe to, to make this clear, uh, so the results I presented today are, are not for generative learning. So they're for supervised machine learning, and um, I don't know whether you can directly apply them to generative learning. What I do know is that um, there are some interesting questions to be asked from the perspective of generative learning in, with quantum circuits. So there are um, some papers, for example, showing that it depends a lot on details. So it depends on what your learning scenario is, but that um, for generative learning, quantum circuits can do some things that are classically hard, um, at least if you have some cryptographic hardness assumptions that basically everybody in the classical machine learning world believes. Um, so there are some cool papers on this by uh, actually some of my co-authors. So let me point you to them. Uh, so here you see Jens and Ryan. So Jens Eisert and Ryan Zwicke, and, and both of them have worked um, ha have worked a lot on this. Um, and they, I think they have two really nice papers about this that I can definitely recommend about um, like generative learning in the sense of what can you do with output outcome probability distributions of quantum circuits. Perfect, awesome. And a lot of people have made requests for um, the resources in your slides. So if if you don't mind sharing maybe your slides with us and we can make them yeah. available with I, I can definitely do that. So um, if you're interested in any of my talks, I always put the slides on my website, um, but I can also share them with you. Then you can forward them to the to the mailing list. Perfect. Or we can just we'll just put a link to your your website and the YouTube. Yeah. Cool. Can I ask a last question? It's probably really a stupid question. Go ahead. <laughs> but as a beginner, you know, in classical machine learning. In the first few slides, when we were going towards, uh, you know, when you were introducing these the terms, mm -hmm. you had this statement that if the hypothesis class is low complexity relative to the, to the data, then you can define this loss function. Yeah, here. So, I so in in we usually start when we study learnability, we say okay, the you know the hypothesis class has to have uniform convergence or it has you know finite VC dimension, yep. but that doesn't always necessarily mean that it has low complexity, which mm -hmm. is essentially, uh, you know, we that's something that we can tune also, like there's the bias variance trade-off. So like, uh, could you elaborate on like the statement 
what is yeah. new here? So I can try my best. Um, so the low complexity here is very, very hand wavy. Um, so you, you shouldn't, um, or you should take this with several grains of salt. Um, but what I mean by low complexity is essentially exactly what you just said. So it's something like, um, in, in terms of any of these measures, mm -hmm. like you see dimension, covering numbers, or whatever, this measure shouldn't be too large compared to the number of training data points you have. And then you have low complexity. But in that sense, low complexity in the learning world is always relative to how much data you have available. Um, but yeah, I was thinking about it in terms of these complexity measures. Okay, okay, thank you. Sure. Cool, so I think we, we actually didn't do too badly even though we messed up the, the links and um, we had lots of great questions and it's uh, late now. So a lot of people have dropped off, but I want to say thank you to everyone who has stayed and um, thank you, huge thank you to Matthias and sorry about the mix up again. I think we must convince Francesco to send you like a, a Uber Eats voucher or something cooler. Yeah, no, we'll do Maybe that, we'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do that. No, no problem. Um, yeah. But it was a great talk and thank you so much for um, yeah for doing it and we will make the recording available for everybody and uh, advertise that and forward questions to you as they come. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much, me. Matthias. It was really nice. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.